Good to be back here at Oakdale. See you another time here. Glad you have us back. Tell you what, not everybody does. <laughs> Take what we can get. We sure love the Lord tonight. I tell you, he's good now as everybody, isn't he? Never let us down. <clears throat> he's not letting you down either. No matter what folks might think or what you might believe, he's never let anybody down. Can't say the same about us letting him down, though. She's gonna try this song. We miss Brother Isaac. Of course, he's working in Oak Ridge. Kind of hard to get here, you know, for a revival meeting a lot of times. But uh, he usually plays this song for. But uh, I'm gonna mess it up. I don't know. We're gonna try it. Though.
you may have sung here before, I don't know, but <clears throat> we need to be standing firm in this day and age, don't we? No matter what comes our way, it's something, something new every day, you know, but uh, tell you what, as long as you're on the Lord's side, he's on yours. Are you outnumber anybody? The song's called Not Losing Me. ago and never tried to sing it. <laughs> Y'all probably know what it's called, Who Am I? And, uh, and I've wondered about that often. That's why we look down upon us, just no speck of dirt's all we are, just nobodies and to choose to leave the splendors of heaven and come down here and give his life for us, an old rugged cross. <clears throat> you know, still today I don't understand that, but you know, as I said, he is love. I'm glad for his mercy, his grace, his long suffering, and anyway, putting up with us like he does. Who am I 
that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way to my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Amen. 
excited as a child of God. It really should. Uh,
I'll give you a minute. I'll get you up here in a minute. I promise. Uh, you know, the ebbs and flows of the Christian from whether you're dipping in the water several times and thinking that you shouldn't have to dip seven times, that after the first time it'd be fine, and you, you know, after time four or five, I guess we sometimes will want to give up, but if we don't do the seventh time, it's not going to, we're not going to get to see that victory, we're not going to see get to see those great things, and, you know, just so many things that God does for us that we just, Honestly, we just take it for granted. We don't. We don't really give two thoughts about it. We just, uh, um, you know, we oftentimes, you know, just like a song you sing, we think of who we are that we're deserving, and friend, we ain't. We just ain't. And I don't know how to put that to you nicely, but we ain't. We do not deserve God's grace. And uh, every time I hear you sing the song of judgment, which. Um, at my house, we've heard you sing that many, many times. Um, just going through, and it puts into perspective that day. That day. Because, you know, the Bible teaches if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. And that's really our only combatant that we have is the word of God and just resisting him and, 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 and trusting that God's got us. But the day that we get to see our victory, our accuser, who's always brings up the old memories that uh, won't ever let you forget what God can't remember. Church, we will be able to stand to and praise, and we can do that now because it's written in God's word, and it's going to happen. We don't have, you know, it's a day that we're waiting for, but uh, we already know it's coming. And so does your accuser. But if he can get those seeds of doubt and he can just keep you just, just stumbling, just tripping, just, you know, just, just, just barely hanging on, that's the only way he can win. And he's not going to defeat God, but he can defeat us by letting us just stumble along. Friend, God's got this. 100% we serve a risen Savior. Death, hell, and the grave cannot stop your Jesus. The same power that raised him from the grave is the same power that he put in you. Well, good evening again. Thank you for the good singing. That was wonderful. We appreciate the goodness of the Lord. <clears throat> we appreciate you being here tonight. Turn with us again to the book of Genesis. And let's go back to Jacob for a few minutes tonight <clears throat> with the help of the Lord. Uh, let me let me say, Brother Tommy, I appreciate the invitation to, to have been here with you this week. And I uh, appreciate church, you being here, and our visiting friends that have come to support the meeting. And we pray the Lord's helped you and uh, that he will continue to help you. Uh, let me get uh, let me get this thing where I want it to be just for a minute. There's a couple of things here I want to give to you, and then we'll get into the text. In the 32nd chapter of Genesis, the story that we looked at last night is the story of Jacob and Jacob's. Uh, Jacob's meeting that's about to take place with his brother Esau. Uh, what we've already heard tonight, what has been sung, uh, what the pastor has spoken about, uh, will we'll, uh, tie in with, I think, what the Lord has for us. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a solemn hour. Uh, I hear people sometimes say, and there's an old song we used to sing that says, no tears in heaven. But I, I do believe that we will cry our most bitter tears as we are preparing to enter in. Because the Bible says that God himself shall wipe away every tear. So why would we do that? I think when, when we see what could have been, 
had we really been surrendered and had we really learned to walk by faith, I think we're going to be sorrowful that, that we just stumbled along. So Now, uh, I, I know I can only speak for me. Uh, I'm a faltering, stumbling believer. Uh, some days I do fair. Some days I don't do good at all. Uh, some days I'm able to look to the Lord by faith and some days it seems like God's a thousand miles away. Now, if that's true of me, I know it's got to be true of you at some time in your life. I think it's a dangerous thing, and, and uh, the old English preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, agreed uh, with this statement. But I think, I think it's a dangerous thing when we have, uh, when, when we portray too, too, uh, too much of an attitude of, of everything's always wonderful. You know, like it's always right on top. We have bad days. We're going to have bad days. You're going to have days that you struggle. You're going to have days when doubts come, fears come. You're going to be overwhelmed. The tempter's going to come. And they're going to be every, every day you're going to have self to deal with. That's the one that I can't get away from. Me, self. The devil is not like God. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at the same time. But I can't get away from me. Everywhere I go, there I am. And I'm the troublemaker. That's why I can relate to Jacob, the schemer, the conniver, the, the supplanter. Uh, someone said a, a wonderful statement, a simple statement, but a wonderful statement once, and I don't know who originally said this, but they said faith means living without scheming. Living without scheming. Now Jacob is a schemer. And as I told you last night, when God gives plan A, there is no plan B. But yet Jacob always wanted to have not only God's program, but he wanted to have Jacob's plan to fall back on. And I think that's typical of all of us. Uh, if God does it, if God works it out, great. But just in case it doesn't work out the way I want it to, I've got my plan B back here, you see. Uh, but, but plan B is never going to be good enough because God always has plan A. So living without scheming. Now, we're going we're gonna to take up tonight uh, kind of where we left off last night. He's at the brook Jabbok, which means uh, emptying place. And, and God has this goal in mind, and that's to get Jacob emptied of Jacob. But let's read on a little bit. It says in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Now he sent all of his family over, all of his possessions over, and he's willing to give all of that up to Esau, but he's still not willing yet to give himself up. So when he's alone in the darkness, knowing that his brother's out there somewhere, All of a sudden, there's a strange thing that takes place. Now, in verse 24, it's strange how the Scripture gives this to us. And Jacob was left alone, semicolon, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. That's kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, it's out of the blue. It says he was alone, and a guy wrestles with him till daybreak. I mean, that's kind of, kind of weird. Now, verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him. And, and when you read this now, you really don't know who's who until later on in the chapter. We're going to find out. But when you're reading this, if you kind of try to think about if you were reading this for the very first time, Jacob's left alone, and all of a sudden there's a wrestling match going on. And he saw that he prevailed not against him, and he touched the hollow of his thigh. Who touched whose thigh? Somebody touched somebody's thigh. And we'll know here in a minute. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? Now, stop right there just for a minute. We're going to find out that this is an angel, maybe the angel of the Lord. Jacob's alone. His family's gone ahead of him. He's by himself in the darkness. He knows that his brother's out there. And just all of a sudden, like a horror movie, he feels hands on him. 
Who do you think, I asked you last night, who do you think he thought that was initially? Probably thought it was Esau. I would have. He thinks it's his enemy, his, his brother, yes, but his enemy that he hadn't seen for about 22 years. And the last time that he saw his brother, he said, I'm going to kill you. When our father dies, and you're in mourning, and I'm in mourning, I'm going to remember what you did in cheating me out of my birthright, and I'm going to kill you. And he saw the man to do the job. He meant what he said at the time. 22 years have passed, though. Jacob has wrestled with his father. He's wrestled with his, he's wrestled with, 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 with uh, uh, his, his father-in-law, Laban. <laughs> he's deceived his father. Remember that? Now, and, and, and now God comes to him as a wrestler. Uh, you know, Abraham was a traveler. Abraham was a pilgrim. And you know that God met him, I think it's Genesis 28, met him as a pilgrim, as a, as a traveler. Uh, you, you'll find that God will meet you many times as you are. And, and the thing that's troubling you, God has a way of bringing that to you and bringing you face to face with it. Now, in Jacob's case, he's wrestled with all these people, not necessarily in a spiritual or in, in a physical realm, but a spiritual wrestling match. And so now he finds himself engaged in this wrestling match that's going to go on until the breaking of the day. And this, this we know later is going to be an angel looks at him and he says the strangest thing. What's your name, son? Now, do you think that this angel was flying around the planet Earth and he looks down and sees Jacob down there by himself and says, you know, there's an old boy down there sitting by the river Jabbok. I think I'll fly down there and wrestle with him until the sun comes up. No, he knew who he was. He knew exactly who he was. But Jacob is going to have to admit who he is. Now, here's the whole message tonight. Do you know who you are in the sight of God? Now, are we his children? Yes, if we've been saved by the grace of God, the blood of Christ is applied because we've repented and we've turned to Christ in faith. But before we can be saved, it's been said many, many times, we have to be lost. Amen. We have to recognize our lostness in order to need a Savior. Now, a lot of people never get lost enough to want to be saved. That's the trouble with America. Nobody's a sinner anymore. Nobody's wrong. It's nobody's fault. You're just born that way. It's just because, you know, you've got a bad temper. That People say it all the time. I can't help it. That's just the way I am. The problem is we don't want to help it. And it is a problem of our birth. It is a problem, something that we are born with. We're born with a sin nature. Every one of us came into this world with it. We didn't have to be taught to sin. We didn't have to be taught to lie. We learned that before we could talk. We learned how to deceive. We learned how to cry out in the darkness. We learned how to cry for attention. We learned how to, to pout. We learned how to be mad over little things. And sadly, some people never outgrow it. So, remember, remember that as far as we know in Scripture, the last time that Jacob was asked this question, and, and the question, really, it's not clear in our translation where he says, what is thy name? That word name, he's really saying, what, what are you known for? See, the names in Scripture had some great significance. And, and it wasn't just that names were thrown out at random, but they had spiritual significance. And, and the name Jacob, this wrestler, this schemer, this conniver, the last time that we know of that he was asked this question was by his own daddy. You remember that? He went in before Isaac and he's, he's conniving. He's doing what Jacob does best. Esau, the Bible says, was a hairy man. How hairy? Real hairy. Because, because uh, Jacob goes out and kills a goat and puts the skins on his, on his arms and around his neck. And, 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 and so the old man, I, his 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 vision is so dim, he can't tell, distinguish who's who. And, and so he has his son to come near him. He said, who are you? And what did he say? He said, well, I'm Esau. Come here, let me feel of you. 
And so the dad puts his hand out and he feels all that hair and he says, yeah, it feels like Esau. It sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau. I guess you're Esau. So you see, he lied about that the last time he was asked, as far as we know. And now the angel says, what's your name? Well, he's not going to lie his way out of this one. And so he's brought face to face, maybe, maybe for the first time in his life, with who are you in the sight of God? What, what are you known for? What is your reputation? Now let me ask you tonight. Have you ever come to the place where you got totally honest with God and you said, Lord, the truth is there's a lot of Jacob in me. The truth is, Lord, I don't usually live without scheming some way or another. I, I don't know. I don't know that any of us know much really about living by faith. I've seen God move. There have been a few instances where I, I've tried to exercise faith. But by and large, over the years, I haven't had to exercise faith a great amount because I always had something to fall back on. Uh, I, I remember a time when at our little bank there in Liberty, Kentucky, uh, to borrow a few hundred dollars, big deal. And it was a big deal. Uh, Mr. Elmer Allen was the bank president. You'd go in to see him if you needed a loan. I remember when I was a, uh, in my late, or well, mid to late teens, probably I went in one day to try to borrow $400 to buy some calves. And Mr. Allen, he was an old man, you know, looked down over his glasses and he he would type out your loan, your, your loan request. You know, he used the biblical method of typing. It was seek and you shall find. And he, he'd look and peck and hunt and peck and he'd type it out. And he was, you need real gruff guys. You need how much money, boy? I said, uh, I need about four hundred dollars, Mr. Allen. He said, that's a lot of money. I said, yes, sir, I know it is. And he said, uh, you got any collateral? Look over his glasses at me, and I said, uh, no, sir. I said, Mr. Allen, if I had collateral, I wouldn't be here. Whose boy are you? I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm Colbert Kaufman's son. Oh, well, I, I guess you'll be all right. Uh, your dad's all right. I guess you'll be all right. I've done business with your grandpa. I, you'll be all right. So he loaned me the money. And uh, then a little later, you'd need to borrow enough money to buy a car. And you'd have to go before the loan committee. And they'd have to think about it. And they'd meet about it. And they'd talk about it. And you'd go in and ask and apply for the loan one day. And about a week later, you'd get the okay or the turn down. Well, as the years passed, not, not that I had achieved anything, not that I had anything, but I guess I'd borrowed enough money over the years and paid enough money back that uh, one day I found myself sitting in one of the little restaurants, you know, and, and uh, president of the bank, new guy now comes through, another guy that came up through the ranks and he comes through and he sees me and said, hey, why, you about ready for a new car? No, sir. All you got to do is come down and see us now. We got the money waiting on you. And so I, I'm telling that long story to tell you, that kind of takes faith out of it, doesn't it? Uh, after a while, you don't really have to pray about it. You just have to go in and apply for it. Or you just have to pull the plastic out and swipe it through the slot and say, hey, I got it. I got it. And churches began to operate like businesses rather than people who operated by prayer. And rather than really seeking the Lord about what he wants for us and really seeing God open the door, we revert back to what Jacob did. And we pray our prayer like he did last night that we read. And then immediately when he closes his prayer, he sets his own plan into operation. <laughs> Lord, remember, Lord, you sent me out on this journey. And Lord, it's up to you to take care of me and blah, blah, blah. And it's a great prayer. But the problem is as soon as he closes it, he says, now, let me gather my herds up and send them out there ahead to meet Esau so that Esau doesn't kill me. So he's not trusting God, even though he says he's trusting God. He prays to God, but then he leaves it at the end of his prayer. He leaves it with himself again. So he's living by scheming, not without scheming. So here he is now face to face with this angelic being. And he says, what is your name? And maybe for the first time in his life, he says, I'll tell you who I am. I'll tell you what I'm known for. I'm known as the schemer. 
If you don't believe me, ask my dad. I, I was a schemer when I, when I deceived my father and made him think I was my brother Esau. I deceived my brother out of his rightful birthright. I deceived my father-in-law Laban. And old Laban took him to school on how to, how to rip somebody off. Laban was a schemer too. But then they parted ways. And, 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 and when I think Jacob, when he got gone from there, he said, good riddance. Now all of a sudden he's got another mile marker in front of him. He's got his brother out there coming to meet him. And he thinks this is him, but it's not. It's not. It's an encounter with God. And what he thought was the worst thing in the world that could possibly happen to him, it wasn't the worst thing. It wasn't his brother. It wasn't a murderer. It wasn't his enemy. It was God. Now let me ask you this. Do we recognize God when he shows up? When something happens in your life and you think it's the worst thing that could possibly happen, let me ask you, is there a chance that it might be God? Is there a possibility that God is wrestling with you saying, what are you known for? What's your reputation? Not necessarily with me, and it was that case with Jacob. That's what men knew him as. The schemer and the conniver that he was. But more importantly, God knew him as that. And Jacob has to get totally honest with God. And here's the thing. God cannot bless you the way he wants to bless you until he finally gets you to the end of yourself. Until he gets you to the place where you say, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm weak. I'm needy. I'm faltering, Lord. Somebody said it like this not too long ago, and I, I read it somewhere, and it really stuck with me. They said that Christians shouldn't strut. Does that make sense to you? Christians shouldn't strut. Now, if you're a farm boy or girl, you know what a strutting rooster is. If you watch any sports, you know what it is to see guys strut. And sometimes gals too. The proud look. And by the way, that's the very first thing that God calls out as one of the seven things that he hates in Proverbs 6. A proud look. And how many Americans are carrying that proud look around about, look at me. You see what I, yeah, here's the thing, I'm old enough now that it's almost comical at times to see some of these some of these young athletes that are so proud of their physique. <laughs> They're so proud of what they are and what they look like and what and I'm thinking, oh bud, just wait a few years. Just wait a few years. <laughs> the time's got a way of taking the pride out of you. I, I used to walk a, a a wall plate when I was helping build houses and uh, that uh, three and a half inch two before I could walk that wall plate and I could carry one end of a truss and never miss a lick. Didn't bother me. I could look down. I could keep right on trucking. Didn't bother me at all. And a year or two ago, I was crossing the gate in the barn and got dizzy. <laughs> I said, what in the world happened to me? Well, uh, that'll take the pride out of you. That'll take the pride out of you. You're a straddle of a gate about four foot off the ground and your head starts kind of I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? This is not like me. And God said, no, no, son, you're getting closer home. That's true of every one of you here. And whether you're 25 or 85, every day that passes over your head, you're getting closer home. And so it would behoove us tonight to acknowledge to God what we really are and, and get the pride out of the way and quit bragging and boasting whether we do it internally or outwardly and just come clean with God and say, Lord, I, I, I got a lot of Jacob in me. Now let's, real quickly, I'm almost done. He said in verse 28, and he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob. So Jacob answered that when he said, What's your name in verse 27? He said, Jacob. I believe he said it with a broken heart. I, I believe that he really realized who he was in the sight of God. And, and this, this being, this angel says, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. 
For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. He said, Not important. You know, he said, It's more important that you recognize who you are right now in the sight of God than it is to know the name of the being. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Now, real quickly, for the rest of his days, He'll be known primarily as Israel, a prince with God, wrestler with God, depending on how it's translated. But once in a while, he'll still be called Jacob. And even on his deathbed, and I love this part, the Bible says that Jacob, Jacob raised himself in the bed and Israel gave up the ghost. So there he is, the two natures still struggling. As a child of God, will you admit that some days you're more Jacob and some days you're more Israel? Some days, some days you can walk like a prince with God and some days you're still the old schemer. Some moments we're close to God, some moments we seem to be a long way away. That's, that's the life of a believer. That's what every one of us wrestle with. So don't ever let anybody deceive you into saying that they're always on the mountaintop. That's not true of anybody. Anybody that tries to come across that way is lying to you. Because they too have bad days. And they too have times of slipping. And they too have times of failure. But as the days pass, we pray that we'll become more Israel and less Jacob. As the days pass, more of God, less of me. Whether it's preaching, working a job, mingling with people in the public area, I pray that it becomes less of Kaufman, more of the Lord. More of Christ, less of me. To the point that I get completely out of the spotlight and I'm completely hidden away. And that all they can see is the Lord Jesus. That's the goal for every child of God. Now, Jacob has had his, his thigh touched by this angel. And I, I don't know why they wrestled all night. Uh, six, seven hours? I don't know how long it was in a long time. And I know that God has sent one angel and destroyed armies with it. So, so this is not a, a matched feat. This is not a fight where... They're evenly matched. I just know that for some reason God allowed him to wrestle till the day broke. Now, I was thinking about this today. I think a lot of things that go through your mind if you fight all night for your life. You're wrestling with this being somewhere in the, in the fight, not, probably not long into it, he realized that this is not Esau. I don't know who this is. I don't even know what this is. But it's not Esau. And as they continue to wrestle and struggle and fight and the kicking and the gouging and the pulling and all the, all the licks that are thrown, all this thing that goes on through the night, all that's going through Jacob's mind has got to be chaotic. And finally, finally this being touches his thigh and cripples him. Now, he could have put a stop to the fight immediately. There wouldn't have been any fight to it. But for some reason, Jacob has to be engaged in this wrestling match, maybe to wear him down. I don't know. But I do know this. The next day, here's this man. All the family knew Jacob. We know Jacob was a proud man. I believe he walked erect and he stuck his chest out and he was proud of who he was. And the family knew him to be that kind of man. But the next morning when they've all gone ahead and they're camped somewhere out there waiting on Esau and somebody looks up and they see coming over the brow of the hill this fella and he's, he's got a pole he's leaning on and he comes a hobbling over the mountain and they look and they say, who in the world? Who's that coming? I don't know, looks like an old man. 
gets a little closer and somebody says, you know what? If I didn't know better, that looks a little bit like Jacob. Oh, it can't be Jacob. Jacob walks with a, he, he's got a proud walk. I mean, old Jacob, he holds his head up when he walks. This guy's leaned over and limping bad. Gets a little closer and somebody said, man, that is Jacob for sure. That is Jacob. And they run out there to meet him and hear it. And I think about this. He's been in the fight all night long for his very life. I think he's got some dried blood on him. Bruises and bumps on his head. Maybe his eyes swelled a little bit. He's leaning on this, this limb or this pole he's got to help him because he's, his hip's out of socket. <laughs> and they come up to this mess of a man that they know to be the schemer, the conniver, the proud Jacob, and they say, man, what in the world happened to you? And he says, if he's honest, he'll say, I just got blessed. I just came from the greatest blessing of my life. I'm a changed man. I'm not the man that you saw when you left me last night. Now, he's a bruised man but he's a better man. You see, sometimes, friends, God has to wrestle you down and bruise you to the core to really get through to you and to really cause you to say, okay, Lord, I agree. I'm what you say I am. Now tonight, we'll all go far in the Christian walk if we'll agree with God that there is none good, no not one. The only good thing that indwells any of us tonight is the Spirit of God. That's all. That's all. You can't make it one day, one hour, one moment in your own power. You need the, the risen Christ who lives and operates through you every moment of every hour of every day. Learn to lean on Jesus. Learn to depend upon Him. Learn to call on Him. Learn when you're about to say something and you know it's going to be the wrong thing. You're about to do something and you know it's going to be the wrong thing. Learn to stop and say, Lord, please direct me right here. Instead of just turning yourself loose, here's what people say. I just had to say something. How's that work out for you? I just had to tell them I had that work out. I'm sure that calmed everybody down. I had to give them a piece of my mind. Let's face it, folks, none of us have that much to spare. So, so let's not be throwing out pieces of our mind. Let's just be saying, Lord, I, I was in a hospital one day. Had a grandson in the hospital. A little social worker came by. And I won't go into that long story, but I was, I was as near to going to jail as I've been in a long time, Richard. My grandson lay in there, and they were going to hold us hostage. Because his leg was broke, he'd, he'd stepped on a basketball and he twisted that big bone in his leg. And, and it was a, that was a red flag for child abuse. And uh, I had driven from Indiana to get there. I, be, I beat my family to the hospital from Indiana. And uh, I was waiting for him. And we'd sit there all night, sit and held that little boy from midnight till 12 the next day. And still hadn't done anything for him. And I was hot. I mean, I, mean, I, I was anything but preacherly. And this little social worker comes and makes some smart remarks to me. And, and I turn and start out the door and I said out loud, I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me because I'm getting ready to do some bad things. And I meant that as much as I've ever meant anything. And I wouldn't try, I mean, I, that came from my soul. Lord, you're going to have to help me. And you know what he did? God did help me. I called a couple of friends. I called our sheriff who was a, a friend of mine. And, and uh, I called my personal doctor, who was a Christian, and he said he, he could tell in my voice how upset I was and how angry I was. He said, Dwight, listen to me. He said, please. This was in the University of Kentucky Hospital in Lexington. He said, listen to me. I'd already thought, I said, Doc, I'm getting ready to take this little boy, and I'm carrying him out of here, and I'm taking him to the house. And he said, Dwight, please don't do that. He said, if you do, he said, they'll have you in jail before you get to the sidewalk. He said, I'm telling you, you're dealing with some of the most, most powerful people in the world, unfortunately. Now, all that worked out, God got it. But I'm telling you that to say, I'm not preaching to you something that I don't know something about. There are going to be episodes in your life, you're going to have to call on God like that and say, Lord, 
I can't do this. I'm getting ready to blow it, Lord. I'm getting ready to mess up bad. All of us have that potential. Don't anybody here think that you're so close to God that you can't blow it? You can. A moment of anger, a moment of lust, a moment of anything that can cause us to just get our eyes off the Lord long enough that we just say, I'm going to do it. And the next thing you know, we're in deep trouble. Deep trouble. A friend of mine in West Virginia, I used to stay in, in the church in the basement. They had a room fixed for me in the corner of the basement. This fella, I laid in his home. He'd bring me a gallon jug of spring water. He'd say, Preacher, don't drink this old city water. He said, I brought you some good water. He always carried around a pocket full of tracks. He was a deacon in this church. I was getting ready to go to that church one night. The pastor called me. had a revival schedule. And he said, I want you to know before you come. He said, we've got a bad situation in the church. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear it. What happened? He said, well, one of our men shot and killed two people. I said, really? And folks, I want to tell you, if I had guessed, if he just said, guess who? This man would have been on the very bottom of the list. And this fella had got into it. He had some, some neighbors that moved down from New York. And they bought the adjoining property, and they, they got into it over a boundary dispute. And one thing led to another, and they got madder and madder, and they, they, just, they just kept picking at him and picking at him and talking to him. And, and he... His kids were grown, but they would make foul remarks to his children, and they would crowd him. You had to drive down the creek bed to get over into his property, and I'd been to his home and ate with him. And he was there shoveling gravel, and they had this on, on an audio tape. The couple had a camera, and they brought it with them, and they were walking down, and, and they forgot to take the lens cap off. And you hear the man say to the woman, there's the so-and-so, and cursed him, you know. We'll, get, we'll, we'll make him do such and such today. And they walk up to this friend of mine, and I went, I, went to the, I went to the trial. I was in a meeting in the area, and I went to his trial, and, and they played this audio tape. And, and, and you, hear, you hear them walk up, and they exchange a few words, and I hear my friend in a strange-sounding voice. I hear him say, do either one of you have anything you want to say before you die? And I hear the chamber of a gun. And he's got a bolt-action 30 off 6 rifle, and I hear him shuck in around. And the guy says, run, he's got a gun. And they start running through the woods, and you hear the gun go off. And all of a sudden, the camera falls. And the, the, the lens cap comes off, and you're looking at the trees up in the woods. And you hear another shot. And then you hear a third shot. And he shot them both in the back. He shot the woman first, and he shot the man the last time. Shot the woman twice, shot the man once, killed them both, went to town, laid his rifle up on the sheriff's desk and said, I've killed two people. And they laughed at him because everybody knew him. Everybody knew this guy, the most mild-mannered guy you'll ever run into. They said, why, Ray, you haven't killed anybody? And he said, you'll find their bodies out there on the edge of my property or on their property. Now, I'll tell you something, church. Don't ever think you're above anything. I went, I went to my friend in the break in that trial, and I said, Ray, I said, I don't know what to say. I said, I'm, I'm sorry this has happened. And he just looked at me and said, Preacher, I'm just glad it's over. Don't ever think that you can't be pushed to the end. I'm telling you some of those sad things to tell you this tonight. We all still have a little of the old nature in us. And unless we learn to walk with God, somebody's love will come along and punch you a button one day and you'll find out just how much Jacob still left in you. I don't want that. I don't want that. I, I know, I know I can, I can be a, a horrible person if I'm left to myself. And I don't want that. I don't think you do either. So if, if we have revival, and at, at this stage of the game in America, we, we need personal revival. And if we have it, it'll be when we cultivate a personal walk with God that we're willing to admit to, to God who we are and we look to Him to change us. Let's stand just for a minute tonight. Father, thank you tonight, Lord, for your word and thank you for your people.
thank you, Lord, for this pastor and, and this congregation and for the invitation to have been here. Lord, we pray that through the course of this week that you have spoken to us clearly, <coughs> that, uh, Lord, you've reminded us of some things through the life of Jacob over the last couple of nights that we've looked at that would remind us tonight that we're really no better than Jacob. It's easy, Lord, for us to look at a man like Jacob and, and be an armchair quarterback and find all kind of faults and ridicule him for who he was, but Lord, the truth is we're just like him. And Father, unless you help us in these dark hours of the soul, unless you help us, Lord, when we're in turmoil, unless you help us, Lord, when our anger is stirred or our flesh is stirred, our self may be stirred in some way, Lord, and unless you help us, we'll surely fall. I pray tonight, Lord, that you've helped someone here tonight and that you'll help us in the days to come in the power of a risen Christ for we ask in his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate the spoken word, read word. Just appreciate God this evening. Appreciate all he's done for us, our church. Um, I appreciate our revival and uh, a time to come together to, to to hear of God, to learn of Him, and to I mean I can only speak for me, but to learn of me, more of me that I didn't, I guess that I always knew that I didn't really, I guess, want to think of. Um, truly appreciate it. Um, I ask you if uh, you just quick song if you would and I want to ask if uh, if Bubba and if MD if you would if you would help me I'd like to take up a love offering for our evangelist uh, I, I can't I appreciate him so much and and his uh, willingness to go and be obedient uh, unto God and to to preach things that can sometimes be hard and preach things that sometimes you know people may not want to hear. Uh, I've, I've been there. Um, and I, I appreciate you. appreciate your willingness. Uh, Bubba and MD, if you would, if, you, if you'd if come and you'd uh, help me, I'll ask Bubba real quick if he, if he bless us off. Your Heavenly Father, we come to you now. Thank you for many blessings you give us life, your Lord. We thank you for the word we've heard preached here now. We thank you for the songs. Thank you for each and every one that's been out with us tonight. Ask you to bless this offering. Let's get on Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There was a time when I fell.
guys. Appreciate you so much. Uh, again, thank you, Brother Dwight, your traveling companion for, for traveling with you through the week. Uh, you know, uh, I'll say this, and I'll cut you loose. Uh, I don't want to keep you in too long. If you're like me, we all need a beauty sleep. Uh, and I think Brother Dwight will understand what I'm saying. I mean, no disrespect to him, but, uh, you know, if you feel good tonight, Brother Dwight didn't bring revival. I want you to understand that that's of God. And I want you to understand that if, uh, just because Oakdale's revival ends tonight, your revival doesn't have to. Revival is something that's personal and it's to you. And if you choose to stay revived tomorrow, that's a decision that you will make in the morning when you get up. If you choose to go back to where you was, you know, prior to Sunday, again, that's a conscious decision that you made. But you can get up tomorrow and you can be just as close to God because God's going to be there. God's already there and he knows what you're going to face. God's good to us. If we was half as good to God as he is to us, just a smidgen, man, what a place we could be. You won't have anything in your heart before we dismiss tonight. I appreciate your attendance. Truly do. Um, uh, glad you could be with us. If you don't have a home church, uh, you know, oddly enough, we meet here about every Sunday. You're welcome to come to Oakdale and uh, uh, come uh, worship with us. We'd love to have you. Uh, again, just like to remind you, you know, coming up in May, on uh, or not in May, but on June the 5th, we'll be having our Bible school here. There's some flyers back there in the back. Um, you can take them, post them at your church, uh, wherever you may go. We'd love to have you kids here. Um, and if your kids are anything like mine, I know you need a break at least one Saturday. So we'd, we'd love to have them. Uh, come be with us if you can. <laughs> MB, you care to dismiss us, please?